Hello and welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's program about Sephardic culture and the situation and the destruction of the community in Salonika. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. I'm delighted to welcome you to our program today with Dr. Joe Halio, President of the Foundation for the Advancement of Sephardic Studies and Culture. Dr. Halio recently republished an annotated first-hand account of the Holocaust that was originally published in 1947, only two years after the war's end, by Dr. Albert Menashe, one of the leading figures from the Jewish community in Salonika, who had been deported to Auschwitz in 1943, but managed to survive. We're holding the program today on March 15th, partially to recognize the anniversary of the first deportations by the Nazis of Jews from Salonika on March 15th, 1943, 78 years ago today. I'm certain that Dr. Halil will talk to us more about those deportations, the destruction of the Jewish community in Salonika, and the window provided into both of those by the eyewitness account of Albert Menashe. Before I introduce Dr. Halil, however, I wanted to take the opportunity to put in an advertisement about some of our other upcoming programs, there they are. Um, particularly before spring has sprung, we've tried to schedule a range of programs to inspire and interest you. Tomorrow, for example, at noon, I'm gonna be leading our monthly virtual gallery tour, this time in honor of Women's History Month, focusing on the lives of women, both women survivors and women persecutors or perpetrators. And tomorrow night at 6.30 in the evening, we have a post-screening discussion with the director and the writer of a new documentary film that you may have seen information about. It just opened last week. It's entitled Still Life in Ludge. The film can be screened virtually at several locations, but near us is the Cinema Arts Center of Huntington. And if you register for our program, you'll receive a link to get a $2 off discount when you purchase the ticket to see the film. So we hope people will watch our program and then uh, watch the film and then join us for the program tomorrow evening. And one more program to mention, this Thursday at 1 p.m., we're holding a book discussion with the acclaimed historian Wendy Lauer about her new book, um, which was recently reviewed in the New York Times, entitled The Ravine. The book looks in detail at a photograph showing a Jewish woman and her child right as they are being murdered by the Nazis and the collaborators during the invasion into the Ukraine. And Professor Lauer has uncovered an amazing amount of material based just on that one image, and she's going to talk about what she's uncovered and the process. Um, I see a comment here about the, oh, oh, the uh, program on when, is on Wednesday, both the, uh, the virtual tour and the um, post-screening discussion, those are both on Wednesday. Uh, you can learn more about those programs and all our upcoming virtual programs on our website by going to www.hmtcli.org and clicking on the events tab. Okay, now to our program today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. And um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Joe Halio. Dr. Halio is a geriatric physician in private practice and a clinical professor of medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. But when not focusing on his day job, he is a leading figure in the effort to sustain Sephardic culture. Dr. Halio was raised in a Sephardic family of immigrants from Salonika and Turkey, and now serves, as I mentioned, as the president of the Foundation for the Advancement of Sephardic Studies and Culture. He also follows in the footsteps of his family members who have a strong connection to Sephardic culture. His grandfather, Albert Torres, was a, the publisher of La Vara, a Ladino language weekly newspaper published from New York City as a national Sephardic Jewish newspaper from the 1920s all the way until 1948. And Dr. Julio's father, Hank Julio, was the author of the 1996 book, Ladino Reveries, Tales of the Sephardic Experience in America. 
Dr. Halio himself has spent a great deal of time both at the Sephardic Home for the Aged in Brooklyn and the Sephardic Jewish Center of Forest Hills, and has traveled in Turkey, Greece, and Israel, where he studied both the Ladino language and explored Sephardic culture. The recent reprinting of Dr. Albert Menashe's 1947 work is just one of his efforts, Joe Halio's efforts, to draw attention to the richness of Sephardic life and the damage done to Sephardic culture by the Holocaust. One final comment from me about our format this evening before we get to Dr. Halio. I have a few questions and I know that Dr. Halio has a presentation that he's planning on getting, at, getting but I also wanna urge you to use the Q&A feature to type in any questions that come up during his presentation and we will make sure to include time for him to answer those questions uh, towards the end of the program. So we wanna include you in the discussion. Okay, with that introduction and the layout of our plan, let me welcome, welcome Dr. Joe Halio to our virtual stage, and I offer my heartfelt thanks for him to join us tonight. So, Joe, can we get you out here? There we go. All right, welcome. Thank you, Joe. Hi, hi. Thank you very much, Thor, and I want to thank you for your uh, enthusiasm and for your encouragement and for setting this up. But just before we start, I do want to thank um, I do have to thank Andrea Bolander for her encouragement and over the years, and also Meryl Menashe, who not related to Dr. Menashe from the book, but quite involved with the museum. So I want to thank her also for her encouragement and inclusion, and also thank Martin Elias, who's uh, board of directors of the museum, and always an enc encouraging Sephardic studies. And I uh, just want to thank them before we start. So um, with that done, um, I think what we ought to do is talk a little bit about Salonika and then a little bit about the book and Dr. Menashe. Um, because Salonika was really the center of the, of the Sephardic community all over the world. And Salonika what, during the war was completely overrun by the Germans, and the Jewish community was completely destroyed. Salonika, most people don't know because the Sephardim are a minority in a minority, and we don't have the voice that the Ashkenazi community has, even in the Jewish world. There's no longer even a Sephardic newspaper, but you'll hear more, that, more about that later. But Salonika was really the center of the Sephardic world. Salonika's chief rabbi, was considered the chief rabbi of Sephardim all over the world, even in Jerusalem. Salonika's chief rabbi named Salonika Mother of Israel, Jerusalem of the Balkans, because such a, it was such a large Jewish community that in a city of over 100,000 people, just under 100,000 people, just under, just under 100,000 people were Jewish at the turn of the 20th century. The Jewish community was a minority and was a majority in Salonika, so powerful that the port was closed on, sa on Sabbath, on Saturday. Saturday was considered the Sabbath in a Christian country and a Muslim dominated country, but no work was carried out on Saturday because the Jewish community was so large. There were 85 synagogues in Salonika, over 15 Talmud Torah, libraries, schools. Salonika had was it was the largest Jewish community in Europe at one point. And the Jewish cemetery of Salonika was the largest Jewish cemetery in the world outside of Jerusalem. The Jewish presence in, in Salonika and in Greece dates back to, the, to Roman times. And the Jewish population of Salonika actually grew mostly with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492 with the Inquisition, and which I guess we could consider really to be the first Holocaust because the Jews of Spain were expelled and those that remained, many of them were murdered. And the Holocaust of the, of the Sephardim is generally overlooked. Not, I must say, by the Holocaust Museum and Tolerance Center in Glencoe because some of you may remember that 
back in 1914, we had a photo exhibit there sponsored by the same foundation for the advancement of Sephardic studies and culture that has now republished Dr. Menesha's book. We had a photo exhibit, Forgotten Images of the Holocaust in Greece. That was sponsored by Kihila Kedosha Yanina, the Broom Street Greek synagogue, which is a Greek synagogue of Roman Jews, a little bit different from the Sephardic community in Greece, which was really came to be dominant in the last in the, in the last few hundred years. But with the Jewish presence in Greece for so many hundred years, the Second World War in three years from 1943 to 1946 really wiped out the Jewish, Jewish presence in Greece. So thoroughly that Sephardic life changed completely in one generation. And it's only now in the last five years that it's really beginning to recover with more notoriety and more world publicity and beginning to have a true rebirth and recognition, not only in the city of Salonika, but throughout Greece and throughout the rest of the Sephardic world as well. We try to bring this information to the Ashkenazi community because the history of the Sephardim is not as well known in the Ashkenazi community. In fact, I gave one of Dr. Menashe's books, this republished book, I gave it to a student at Yeshiva University to read, and he told me, oh, I had no idea that there were Jews in Greece. So it's a story that really has to be told. And it's a story that was written by Dr. Menashe, partly during his stay in the camp, and mostly written and put down on paper during his stay in, in a DP camp, in a displaced persons camp, after the war. He was able to save some notes and he had a great memory and he was able to put together this book, which is a great, very detailed study of how the concentration camp operated. It's one of the most detailed study, studies of how the concentration camps operated. And he talks about many subjects, many topics that, and, and many, many things that occurred in the camp, for instance, he talked about the Sonder Commando, uh, which, was, which was the death brigade, the, the, the workers in the camp who had to operate the crematoria. And he talked about the Canada com Commando. And he talks about the death march from, from the liberation from Auschwitz and, and moving the victims from one camp to another. And he talks about how people survived and how people perished. And we decided that we would reprint the book because it was written in such detail and first published in 1946 in the United States. Dr. Menashe wrote the book in French, which was not his first language. His first language was actually Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, which he spoke at home. But there was a big, uh, there was a, a great French influence throughout the Sephardic community of the Balkans in the late, in the late 1800s and early 1900s through the Allianz Israelite Universelle, which was a, a system of schools to bring Western culture to the, Ottoman, to the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. So many Jews did learn French. And he wrote the book in French. And when I asked him why, why he didn't write the book in his own native language or why he didn't write the book in Greek, because it's about the Greek community, he, he laughed at me and he said, uh, I write it in French because French is the language of the, of the educated world. And he wanted the entire world to know what would happen so that, so that they would never forget and never allow it to happen again. So the book came to the attention of a relative in the United States who published the book first in 1946 to raise money for, to support the Jewish community of Salonika and get, help, them, help them rebuild the Sephardic community of Salonika. And to me, it's a shame that the book never went further than that. The book had one printing in 1946 of about a thousand copies and raised a substantial amount of money which was quickly sent to Salonika to help the Jewish community there rebuild. And then another book was published to raise more money to send a second sum of money to help the Jewish community throughout Greece, Salonika and Athens, 
And the book never went further than that. And it wasn't still from almost 10 years before another, another book published about the Holocaust became famous, and that was Elie Wiesel's book, Night, which, which brought the Holocaust to the Western community in English. And it, it's a shame to me that the book never really went further than that, that Dr. Menashe's book never really went further than that. But the Sephardic community being a minority didn't have that kind of ambition. They were focused on helping each other and helping the, the Sephardic community rebuild in Salonika because Salonika had been so famous and so important. And it did accomplish that. The book did accomplish that. But it took many years for the book to get recognized. And then in 1974, it was republished in Greek and actually used in Greek schools to educate Greek students about the Holocaust and the history of the Second World War and also the, the hardship that, that the Greek nation went through with German occupation in the Second World War. And the book has been out of print in English. And it's a book that I've wanted to print, re republish for many years because I knew Dr. Menashe personally. I met him at the Sephardic Home for the Aged in Brooklyn where he became the doctor after he emigrated from Greece. Dr. Menashe himself was, was a prominent figure in pre-war Greece, before the Second World War, he was briefly the secretary of, of the Jewish community, which had a Jewish community council, which actually ran the religious functioning of the entire city and the entire country of Greece. Um, all Jewish functions went through the Jewish community. If you were not a member of the Jewish community, you could not get married, you could not get buried, you could not have any, any Jewish function without being a member of the Jewish community. So he briefly served in the Jewish community before the war, but he was also a well-recognized doctor. He was director of the maternity hospital. He became director of the two orphanages, the girls' orphanage, orphanage in Salonika and the boys' orphanage in Salonika. And he was also a musician. And he was a, he was a, a well-recognized musician. Uh, Salonika had a community orchestra and he played the flute in the community orchestra it was not a paid position, position. it was a, a, community, a community program. And it served him well after, later on. Uh, he was also drafted into the Greek army when, when the Germans invaded, when the Italians invaded Greece in 1941, and he served in the army. And then when the Italians capitulated, he returned to Salonika. And as he says, witnessed the destruction of the Jewish community. And he himself went to the concentration, was taken to concentration camp along with his wife and his daughter and all the rest of his family whom he numbered in the 40s, including cousins, nieces and nephews. He had himself, eight brothers and sisters and their families all perished. He had, he had one brother whose sons became partisans and survived, only two other people from his family. And when he returned to Salonika after the war, he, he was able to remarry. He married a woman whose family had also perished, who had, had no family left. And when he got back to Salonika, he found that he was in the same position as the few survivors that did return. Of the 55,000 Jews from Salonika, who perished among the 72,000 72, or so Greek Jews that perished. Of the 55,000 Jews from Salonika, only 1,200 or so survivors from Salonika returned. And when they returned to Salonika, they found the city in total ruins. They had no homes, they had no stores, they couldn't find any of their property. Whatever property that was not destroyed was, was taken by Greek citizens who moved into their houses and, and usurped their property. And they were totally destitute. The only help they got came from the United Nations and, and a little from the Greek government and from the Joint Distribution Committee, the American Joint Distribution Committee, which was doing charity work to help the survivors. And it might seem unusual to us, but when the survivors came back to Salonika, 
they found themselves so destitute that they were actually in competition for whatever, whatever aid they could get. And they began to fight with each other and argue with each other about who was entitled to, to more aid more quickly and who should get reparations more quickly. And Dr. Menashe realized that if they didn't unify, they would actually get nowhere. So he was able to unify the different factions of the city, of the survivors in the city, which included different groups. One group was a group of survivors that had been in the camps. They had formed their own, their own uh, organization. It was called the Union of Deportees. And another group was the Zionist group who favored having all the Jewish people of Greece move to Israel. Another group was, were the group of men, mostly men, but some women who had joined the partisans. Another group was a group of survivors that had been hidden by Greek families, although it was a smaller group. But there were some survivors who actually returned to natural freedom life without having any families return, had lost their families just as well, but they were hidden in Greece, so they survived. And, and then there were political groups like the communists who found themselves ostracized by the rest of the Greek community. So Dr. Menashe was able to get representatives from each of the groups to sit down together and unify. And they, he actually asked them and, and got them to sign a document stating that they would unify for the benefit of the Jewish community of Greece. And after he did that, he was quickly elected president of the Jewish community of, of Greece and um, was able to oversee the rebuilding of the community, including collection of money and distribution of money, negotiating with the Greek government to get some of the, some of the property back for the, that the Jewish community owned, some private property, but not much, and able to make, uh, to be a liaison to the United Nations Relief Fund and also to the Joint Distribution Committee to establish uh, means of reestablishing businesses for men to go to work and reestablishing communal life with the establishment of, of a synagogue and Jewish holidays and rebuilding Jewish ceremonies and religious affairs. So once that had happened, once the, once the, uh, the community was set on the path to rebuild, many of the, many of the, of the few survivors that, le that were, had returned to Greece decided that it was really untenable for them to stay in Greece because they were not able to recover their property. They were not able to recover their businesses and they had no money. But many of them had relatives in the United States, mostly in New York, who had come to New York before the Second World War, either at the turn of the first of the 20th century during the Balkan Wars or during the 19, early 1920s after the fire in Salonika, which destroyed a major part of the city also and caused some great poverty. So many of the families that were left in Greece actually were able to emigrate to the United States after the Second World War. And Dr. Menashe, seeing that the community was well on its way to being reestablished and have a good Jewish communal life, decided that he, with his wife, who both had small families in the United States, decided to come to the United States to reestablish themselves. And he came to the United States at a very opportune time in 1951, 1950, 1951, just at the time that the Sephardic Home for the Aged in Brooklyn was, getting, was being established to protect the Sephardic community in New York, who was actually lacking in medical care because the Sephardic community was not accepted into the Ashkenazi community and had not been, was not able to benefit from the, medical, from the medical facilities in New York, the Jewish nursing homes in New York. So the Sephardim in New York decided to establish a Sephardic nursing home. And Dr. Menashe was a perfect fit to be the doctor there because coming from Greece, from Ottoman times when he was born in Greece, he spoke Spanish as did the rest of the Sephardic community. He spoke French, he spoke Greek, he spoke Turkish, he spoke Italian. He even learned German and some Yiddish and learned, and learned English when he came to the United States. He studied for a year in New York, regained a medical license in New York and went to work at the Sephardic home where he worked for 25 years. And that's where I met Dr. Menashe. My grandparents 
Uh, my father's mother was a resident at the Sephardic home, and my mother's father was the publisher of, this, of the Sephardic Ladino newspaper in New York from 1913 until 1948. And because of that relationship, because my grandfather was the publisher of the newspaper, he had had correspondence with Dr. Menashe before the war started, and also had correspondence with Dr. Menashe after the war while he was trying to rebuild the community. And so the newspaper was actually used to begin charitable collections in New York and throughout the United States to send money to Greece to help the survivors. So I had a personal connection to Dr. Menashe and as I grew up, I got to know him. And when I went to medical school, when I decided to go to medical school, I told him about it and we became even closer and we used to meet very frequently. And that's how I learned about the Holocaust. Dr. Menashe first gave me his book when I was in college and started to talk to me about the Holocaust. And um, that's how I learned about the Sephardim in the Holocaust. And it has basically been overlooked by general Holocaust studies. And so I've gotten some help from different Sephardic organizations and we've put together some Sephardic programs and we had a program at the museum, The Forgotten Holocaust, photo images. And that, that program was taken to other museums. It was shown in Washington DC and in, in Battery Park Museum of Jewish Heritage. And we've had some success, but I've wanted to republish this book and now we've finally done it. And uh, we're able to tell the story of the Holocaust and how Dr. Menashe survived uh, by not only by, by being a doctor, he was able to survive because he was a musician. When he first landed in the camp, he was on one of the, late, the later transports from March 15th until June, the end of June. 55,000 people from Salonika were deported. And then over the next year, the rest, of the, the rest of Greece was depopulated and all the Jews of the rest of Greece, including Rhodes, which was under Italian, uh, Italian jurisdiction, all the Jews of Greece were deported to concentration camps, mostly to Auschwitz. And of course, the Sephardim from, from the rest of the Balkan world, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia um, were also perished. So Greece had the highest, the highest percentage loss of any country in, in Europe. And most people do not know that. Because it's a smaller community, it may be a lesser number in actual numbers, but the, but the percentage of the population of the Jewish community was the greatest of all the countries in Europe. But Dr. Menashe arriving in, Mau in, in Auschwitz, just coming off the transport, the train, met a cousin and his cousin said to him, don't tell them that you're a doctor, tell them that you're a musician because musicians get better treatment. You'll be in the orchestra, you'll be fed twice a day, not once a day, and you'll get better treatment in, in the camp. So he did. The only possession he had brought with him when he left Greece was his medical diploma and his flute. So he very quickly ditched his medical diploma, diploma and kept his flute and got into the orchestra and was able to use his influence and his better position to actually help other victims in the camp survive. And part of that story is told in the book. When I republished the book, I didn't want to only include that story of the camp that Dr. Menashe had published, but I did want to include what he did when he got back to Greece. And the second half of this republished book tells about the rebuilding of the community, how he was able to unify the community. We actually have documents that I was able to garner from the archives of the newspaper La Vara, which was published in New York. We were able to save documents and letters and articles from the newspaper and republish some of that in this book to substantiate exactly what he did. And while I was working on this book, another, another uh, family of survivor, survivors from the Sephardic Jewish Center in Forest Hills, which was originally in the Bronx, the Sephardic Jewish Center of the Bronx, where many survivors from Salonika moved when they came to New York and joined the Sephardic community of New York, which was in the Bronx was mainly Salonika community who had, who had lived in New York from before the war. 
joined together and one of the survivors families gave me a document which is a short testimony of another survivor who actually in his testimony corroborates what Dr. Menashe had written in his documents and in his speeches to the community in his attempts to rebuild the community. But there is another fascinating story there and that is the story of the Jewish collaborators in Salonika during the German occupation. And we're able to tell the story of this unique situation, which is hardly ever written about. I thought that while I was working on this book, I had a story that no one had ever told before. And it's the story of the Jewish police in Salonika that actually arrested and mistreated tortured and turned over their own Jewish relatives to the SS. And while I was working on this book, to my surprise, another book came out. And that is a book called Family Papers, a journey of, uh, through the 20th century of a Sephardic family in Salonika by Sarah Rabia Stein. And to my amazement, it's a story about a family in Salonika that spans 100 years from the late 1800s to present times. And one of the members of that family was one Vital Hasson, who was the chief of the Jewish police, the collaborators, who turned over the other members of their families and Jewish community to the, to the SS. So I immediately, when I saw that book, just about, just about a, a few months to a year before Dr. Menashe's book came out, was republished, I, I wrote to Sarah, Stein and told her that I read her book and she had some information about, about the, the Jewish police, the collaborators that, that I did not have. And I actually had some information that she did not have. So we were able to share that information and bring it out. And it is also told in Dr. Menashe's book because Dr. Menashe cried about the injustice and asked for the Jewish community not to rest until justice could be done, not only in Greece, but through the whole world to, to let the story be told. And it turns out that after the war, in Greece, it is the only, Greece is the only country where a Jew, a Jewish person has ever been arrested, tried, convicted, and punished for collaborating with the, with the Nazi regime. And that story is told in Dr. Menashe's book. It's quite an important book and it, it tells the story before and after the war. And I'm very happy that we were able to publish it and bring it out now. And uh, I'm sure some of you may have specific questions or other questions, and I think we can take some questions now. Thanks very much, Dr. Halio. Thanks for, for that presentation. And, and uh, I see a couple of questions coming in, and I encourage others to join them. Uh, somebody just con wanted for confirmation on the numbers here. You said, I think, 55,000 was the number of Jews who were living in Salonika. And how many survived? Well, the numbers, are, the numbers given in the book are the numbers that Dr. Menashe knew when he wrote the book in 1945. He didn't have the information that we have now, of course, but we knew that there were about 75,000 Jews in Greece, maybe less, maybe a little more, probably a little bit less, about 75,000 Jews in Greece, and most of them lived in Salonika. There were lots of small towns in Greece that had Jewish populations, and of course, Athens was the other big city of, of Greece that had a, a smaller population than Salonika, and it was not as, as prominent a Jewish community as Salonika was. Salonika, remember, was called Jerusalem of the Balkans. It was the center of Sephardic life all over the world, including New York, including Istanbul, including Jerusalem. And there were about 55,000 Jews in Salonika, and only about 1,200 from Salonika survived. Overall, there were a little over 2,000 survivors from Greece, but about 1,200 from Salonika. But I mean, some, people will, some people will question those numbers. Shocking. Yeah. There, there probably are, there probably is better data now in some more modern studies. 
um, can I ask you a, a question which is about why do you think this story is not more well known? I mean, given those kind of numbers and the staggering toll that the Holocaust took on the Jews of Greece, why is that overlooked often and instead people focus on the story of the Jews of Poland or in Germany where the population was less than 1% of the population? I think there are several reasons. I think one reason is that, again, the Sephardic community is a minority. It's a small minority. And in the United States, even more so. Um, it, the Holocaust did not affect the Turkish Jewish community in the same way. They, they were not deported and they were not arrested. Um, they were persecuted with taxes but during the war, but they were not arrested and, and, and persecuted that way. They were not murdered. And so the Holocaust, where the, where the Sephardic community exists in a more original form, in a more classical form, was not affected that way. In the United States, the Sephardic community is a minority in the Jewish community, and a small minority, and also an assimilated minority. Many Sephardim in the United States married Ashkenazim. And they tell the story of the Ashkenazim, and they don't, you know, the, the Sephardic community in the United States did not have a central, a central uh, unifying board. The Sephardic community in the United States has always been splintered, except for the Sephardic home. The Sephardic home is actually the, the Sephardic home for the aged in Brooklyn was actually the only Sephardic organization in the history of New York City and the United States that the entire Sephardic community supported. Otherwise, the Sephardic community in New York was divided among the different communities of the Sephardim. The Salonika Jews had their, own, had their own community. The other Greek cities, Jews from other Greek cities had their own. The Castoria Lees, the Monaster Lees, the Rhodes Lees, the Stambul Lees. They stayed separate. They didn't unify in the United States. So they didn't have the ambition and the backing to tell a unified Sephardic story. And they didn't have the machinery behind them. They couldn't even support a newspaper beyond 1948. The Sephardic newspaper after the Second World War, it teetered along until it finally disappeared in 1948. Because the language of the Sephardic Jews did not persist in New York and the United States, which was Judeo-Spanish. The language is gone, except for now it's having a rebirth. It's being taught again in the United States. I taught a class. class I read that you had taught. <laughs> it's being taught now online by several teachers, University of Pennsylvania, um, has, has a class with Daisy Sadaka, um, State University of New York in Binghamton with Brian Kirshen has Ladino classes, University of Seattle with Devin Nahr has Ladin Sephardic studies. It's becoming more popular again. And, and just now it's being, Ladino is being taught in Greece again in Salonika. And, and uh, as an almost brilliant idea that in Greece, Ladino is being taught in a way not to teach the Spanish language to Greek students, but to teach the history of the Jewish community in Greece, in Spanish, at the, at the university, at the Aristotle University in Salonika, which is a major university in Greece and sits on the property of the Jewish cemetery that was destroyed by the Nazis during the Second World War. It's, it's a brilliant way to teach the language. And it's, it's happening now. So there is a rebirth of the Sephardic community and the Sephardic language now. And Sephardic culture and history is being retaught now. It's coming out again. It's late. It's been a long time overdue, but it is, it is coming. A, a couple of people are asking questions or making comments about the, what's Salonika like now? Are there synagogues there? Is there a, a Jewish, somebody mentions a Jewish museum there? What is there, and you mentioned this university on the site of where the Jewish cemetery, what are, what's left of the Jewish community or what has been rebuilt? The, the Jewish community of Salonika now is a small Jewish community. It is not the largest community in Greece. Athens has more Jews than Salonika now, but um, there is a Jewish presence in Salonika. There are two synagogues. Um, people do not speak Spanish at home or in the street anymore, unless, unless there's a reason for them to have learned it maybe through their grandparents who were survivors and insist on it. But few people speak Ladino. Some do, some of the older people do, like in New York. 
Very few people my age actually do speak Ladino, but people are learning. But there are two synagogues now, and there is an active Jewish community, and they are getting more support from around the world. There is a Jewish museum in Salonika. It's a small museum, but it is open to the public. And there is a, a major plan now to build a Holocaust museum in Salonika. They've gotten, they've gotten money from, from, from Germany, from the Claims Conference, to get started, and it will happen. There is a Jewish Museum of Greece in Athens, which tells the story of the entire Jewish community of Greece and the entire history of the Jewish Museum of Greece in Athens. It's very active. It's a little bit larger, and it's growing. But if you travel to Salonika and you don't know anybody who's Jewish, you will have a hard time finding that there was ever a Jewish presence in Salonika. It's mostly been eradicated after the Second World War, and it's only now, in the past few years, that it's beginning to be recognized by the Greek government again. The Greek government and the Greek people are beginning to recognize the Jewish presence in Greece, not only in Salonika, but in other cities as well. For instance, in the, in the city of Castoria, about 200 miles north, about 100 miles north of Salonika, there is a Holocaust, a Holocaust Memorial Monument, which was placed about 25 years ago. But now in the last few years, there is an annual memorial service to commemorate the Jewish community and the Holocaust every year in, in that town and in some other smaller towns. But if you went there and you didn't know anybody, you'd have a hard time finding a Jewish presence there. Somebody is talking or asking a question about the Sephardic community here in the New York area and mentioning that the Sephardic home was sold. Is that something that's recently happened? And what's going on with the Sephardic community around us? Well, the Sephardic home, as I said, was the only Sephardic organization in the United States that was supported by every other Sephardic organization. And for its first 30 years, from 1950 to 1980, or 1950, 51 or two when it opened until the 1980s, it was truly a Sephardic home. It was a nursing home, but it was more than a nursing home. It was a home. There were, in the beginning, 15, 25 residents, and then expanded to 75 residents. Then we were able to raise enough money to big, build a, a bigger building and had at the end 200, 275 residents. But for the majority of the time, it was a Sephardic home. Everyone there was Sephardic. Almost everybody spoke Ladino or Greek or Turkish or French. A little bit of Italian was heard there also. The food was Sephardic food. The entertainment was Sephardic entertainment. The doctors were Sephardic. It was a Sephardic place. It was truly a home for elderly people that were displaced here for whatever reason and needed a home. And as the, as the Sephardic community became more affluent and less needy, we had less need for a nursing home for our elderly. And nursing homes changed entirely and became more hospital-like. And there was less need for a Sephardic home. And the nursing home indus industry changed and the Sephardic home be began to become unprofitable. Whereas in the beginning, it was supported only by charity when nursing homes became a business with the support from Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that worked for a short time, but then it became highly unprofitable and really ceased to serve the mission that it was set out to serve. So we decided that the Sephardic home could be sold and the money from the Sephardic home that we actually got for the sale of the Sephardic home is now being used for a charity for healthcare for the elderly. And uh, that's, this is a, really a different topic, but uh, Sephardic home as it was known does not exist anymore. I don't think there will ever be a Sephardic home like that again. There is a Sephardic home in Istanbul, which serves the, which serves the elderly community of Istanbul. It's called Or Yom. And it's very similar to what the Sephardic home in New York was in the 1950s. It is truly a Sephardic home for Sephardic elderly who, who need a home and, and medical support and a place to live. But it's really another topic.
just a, a, a reminder to get back to the topic, particularly for tonight. Uh, tell us, how can we get a copy of your book? Uh, the best way to get a copy of the book is to write to me, just to send an email to sephardicpublishing at gmail.com. Now, it's not, a, it's not a, a website. It's an email address. Okay, sephardicpublishing at gmail.com. You send an email to that address, we'll arrange for you to get a book. There is this, the Foundation for the Advancement of Sephardic Studies and Culture has a website, but the website needs a little bit of work and we're working on it. But the easiest way to get the book is to write to sephardicpublishing at gmail.com. Excellent. I put it in the chat. We'll also include it in a follow-up email just so people will, will know how to get a copy. Um, it really is, as you've said, I mean, I can attest as well, just opens a, a window into a world that is not often discussed and not often remembered. And the, I, I will just uh, add my two cents to say that those additions that you've made in the republishing here by including the, the post-war documents really, and the annotations that you've included, they really do add quite a lot to uh, what's covered in this. And so really a fabulous addition to scholarly work and, and this window into the past. Um, somebody is, is just asking us to remind everybody, and I don't know about this film, but apparently you do, uh, about the lost Jews of, um, of Castoria. Am I pronouncing that correctly? And the, yes. the documentary that was on PBS. Can you talk to us about that? Yes. Uh, some 25 years ago, um, well, a little longer than that, back, back in, 18, in, 19, in 1989 or so, uh, I had been working with two other um, of my colleagues about the history of Salonika, and we were actually able to make a documentary about Salonika called Ottoman Salonika, a half hour documentary about the history of the city and the Jewish community. And then shortly after that, the Jewish community in Forest Hills, the Sephardic community in Forest Hills asked me to make a documentary about the Holocaust in Salonika, and we made another documentary called Povereta Salonika, unfortunate, the unfortunate situation of Salonika, the destruction of the community by the Holocaust. And shortly after that, we were able to put together our first photo exhibit, which was called Portraits of Our Past, um, photographs from, from Salonika and from the rest of Greece, which was, was a very high quality photo, photo exhibit which we later on took to the Holocaust Museum of Tolerance, Tolerance Center in Glencove back in 2014. When we had the exhibit in 2014, we had already been working on this film documentary about the city of Castoria because having worked on, on mostly focused on the, on the situation in Salonika, there is a Jewish community of Castoria in New York. There is a Castorelli synagogue in Brooklyn and a Castorelli synagogue society in New York. And some of the members asked me to make a film of, film about the Jewish community of Castoria. Uh, it wasn't as easy to get done and it took much longer, but uh, through some help with Martin Elias and, and Larry Russo, um, Larry Confino was able to make a film about um, the history of, of, we started out to make a history of the Jewish community of Castoria, but it actually wound up being a Holocaust story. It's the story of, of Lena and Benny Elias. It's called Trezoros, Treasures, the lost community, the lost Jewish community of Castoria. It tells the story of the Jewish community of Castoria. It tells the story of, of the deportation from Castoria to the concentration camp. A year later after Salonika, the deportations from the rest of Greece took place a year after Salonika, mostly. Um, and not everybody from, not everybody from Castoria went to Auschwitz, but to other camps as well. Um, so this film, Trezoros, uh, was finally made and we were able to get it shown across the United States at many venues and on PBS. And perhaps we could show it again at Holocaust Museum and Tolerance Center. That, that would be great, I think. I think it's time to do it. We never have actually shown the whole film at the Holocaust Museum and Tolerance Center. We actually showed um, takes from the film while we were working on it back in 2014. 
Um, it is available also, uh, it is available for purchase on a, on, a, on a disc, CD. If you write to me, we can get you information about that also. Um, so, but, but so when people start to gather again, um, it might be a good idea to show it. Absolutely. Let me ask you one other question. I know we need to wrap up, but there's, there is something uh, that at the beginning of your book where you describe, among other things, the, the, among other reasons why you, you republish this, and you talk about going to Dr. Menashe's grave. Could you talk to us a little about that? What did you find there, and what, what inspired you about that? Well, of course, I knew Dr. Menashe personally. But when he retired from the home, from the Sephardic home, he was almost 80 years old when he retired. And he moved to Florida. Uh, he and his wife, they were elderly, they moved to Florida. There was a Sephardic Jewish community in Miami of survivors from Salonika who were also elderly. He was one of the oldest survivors because he was already in his 40s when he, when he arrived at, at Auschwitz. But he was able to survive being in the, in the orchestra and he moved to Miami and lived in Miami. But every time I went to Florida, I used to go to visit him in Miami. And of course I lived in New York and when he passed away in 1991, uh, his, his family called me, told me that he passed away. His attorney, he had no children of course, his wife was already deceased. His attorney called me and I told them that I would come to the funeral. He passed away on a Wednesday. I think the funeral was on Friday. And I could not get a flight to Florida because there was, a, there was a hurricane in New York. I could not get a flight to Florida. So I called my father who also knew Dr. Menashe and my father went to the funeral. And I told the attorney that when they had an unveiling, I would come to Florida and go to the unveiling. But it never happened and you know, things happen and life gets in the way and, uh, and that was that. When I was working on the book, I decided that since I had never, I had not gone to the funeral and I had never heard about an unveiling, I decided I would go to the cemetery to visit his grave. And to my dismay, I was astonished to find that there's no stone on his grave. And I decided at that time that I would use some of the proceeds from the book put a stone and a proper marker on his grave. And uh, we'll, we're going to do that. That's so, that's cool. uh, yeah. Yeah. It's an inspiring, it's inspiring to see that early in the book. And I wanted to make sure everybody knew what that was going on. Um, one last question I think we have time for. Somebody asks about, is there a way, or maybe there is already a way for descendants of people from Salonika, or of Jews from Salonika to gather or to meet? Do you know, is there a forum or a way for uh, descendants of Jews from Salonika to get together? Well, people are not gathering right now. Yeah. Um, the forum, forum, I don't know of any specific forum online for Jews of Salonika. However, the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America is an organization based in New York, quite active, with a, re with a, a, fair, a fairly large membership. It was originated by Jews from Salonika in 1910 in New York City. It started out as a Salonika society. It was called the Salonician Brotherhood and became the Sephardic Brotherhood and then later became the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America. It is active. Um, you can write to their, to their, uh, to the, their email is info at sephardicbrotherhood.com. I think it's info at Sephardic Brotherhood of America.com. No, I, I, uh, yeah, I think, well, anybody, yeah, write, really write to me at Sephardic Publishing, Sephardic Publishing at gmail.com, I'll get you all the information you want. We'll, we'll try and put it in a follow-up email. We'll, that's a, yeah. okay, so the, we're okay. asking for the names of the movies and stuff, so we'll put it all. There are, ways, there are ways to contact other people, families from Salonika. So um, we can help with that. I see somebody's also mentioning, I'll just mention it on air, somebody's mentioning another documentary about the Holocaust in Rhodes that was a film by Ruggiero Gabay, maybe I'm mispronouncing that, uh, but just uh, another, another window into this history that's often mis misremembered or not, or not often talked about. I haven't seen the film. Um, there is a Rhodes Lee Society based in Los Angeles. 
I'm sure you can find it online. If you look for, if you look for Rhodes Jewish Community, I'm sure you can, they have a Rhodes Jewish Community Historical Society also. So I'm sure you can find their information online. Dr. Helio, thank you so much for this presentation, for all this information, and for drawing our attention back again to this often forgotten history. So thanks very much for coming and speaking to us this evening. Lauren, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining us. I hope to see you at other programs soon, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good night.